Welcome everyone from the main campus of the University of Notre Dame, I should say the main building. Um, it is uh, an absolutely gorgeous spring day uh, here on campus. And, uh, and I would say that my feelings right now are bittersweet as I know uh, they are for many of us around here. We just had our uh, 178th uh, commencement weekend. And uh, right now the campus is quiet before um, the students will return for the summer session. The first time since COVID uh, that we're going to have uh, many of the sports summer camps uh, back here on campus and, and the, the campus will be full, full with life uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. But right now it's a little quiet, except for the scaffolding that is going up here around the main building. Uh, they're, they're, they're building the scaffolding right now and uh, the regilding of the dome, which occurred about 20 years ago, uh, will take place over the next uh, four to five months. Uh, and uh, that's quite an operation. So it'll be a little bit noisier here uh, around the main building. Uh, we had a great commencement weekend. Uh, as many of you know, Juan Manuel Santos uh, was the, uh, the commencement speaker, Nobel Prize laureate, former uh, president of Columbia, called all of our students uh, to seek in their own spheres of influence to be peer peacemakers and then uh, the 2023 Leitari medalist went to Sister Rosemary Connolly, uh, the, the, the founder and executive director of Misericordia, uh, and she's been a lifelong advocate for individuals with developmental uh, uh, challenges uh, intellectually and physically, and, uh, and, and just a, a wonderful uh, other host of laureates. But we were able to confer over 3,200 degrees on uh, undergraduate and, and graduate and professional students. So it was a great, great day. Uh, this weekend, I'm gonna be heading out with my family uh, to Philadelphia uh, for our men's lacrosse team that will be uh, a part of the Final Four. We play against uh, UVA on Saturday at 2.30. So tune in uh, to ESPN and watch the game if you can't make it to Philadelphia yourself. And uh, uh, we're, we're right there and hoping that uh, we can bring back our first uh, men's uh, national championship. Uh, the, the finals will be then on Memorial Day on Monday. Um, next weekend, uh, believe it or not, already uh, June 2nd to the 4th, we'll rep welcome back over 3,000 um, members of our alumni and five-year increments for alumni reunion weekend and uh we're gearing up for that. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure now uh, to introduce to you somebody who needs little introduction after his first year as the Charles and Jill Provost uh, for the University of Notre Dame. Uh, John McGreevy oversees all academic enterprises uh, at the university. Uh, prior to being the Provost, he served as the IA O'Shaughnessy Dean of the Notre Dame College of Arts and Letters from 2008 to 2018. Uh, obviously a graduate of Notre Dame. Uh, he's an acclaimed historian uh, doing his PhD at Stanford and then uh, teaching for several years at Harvard before coming back to lead our history department. Uh, his area of expertise is in American and global religion and politics. He's taught courses in US political history uh, as well as on global Catholicism and uh, he's written several books, and his latest, which I think is his opus, is called Catholicism, A Global History from the French Revolution to Pope Francis. Talk about uh, a really broad and, and, and ambitious theme. Uh, he's already uh, won the, the hearts and minds of everybody here on this campus for his leadership as provost. Uh, so excited to, uh, to be able to work alongside with him and under his leadership uh, each and every day at Notre Dame. Uh, I want to just start out with a, with, a, with a zinger, not a soft question, uh, but a tough one. So the Times, John, uh, a literary supplement in, uh, in England, uh, wrote about your, your recent book on Catholicism. They said this, McGreevy is more than an accomplished Catholic historian. Since his appointment last summer as provost of the University of Notre Dame, McGreevy carries a megaphone in the global community of Catholic higher learning. The fate of Roman confession 
lies with McGreevy himself, alongside other movers and shakers of Catholic higher education, whose sites will help to de determine whether or not Catholicism has a future. <laughs> so that is pretty lofty praise, and that's uh, quite a burden to carry on your shoulders. But 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 speak a little bit to 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 that uh, very those are very affirming words about your role as as a leader in not just Notre Dame but in Catholic higher education and the challenges and and, and the burden and the hope uh, to carry that that forward into the world during these difficult times. So Lou, two mistakes already. One is you didn't tell people the book is available for sale. <laughs> so we're only six months till Christmas or nine months till Christmas. So there's you know, plenty of chance to buy it. And then second, you know, I mean, that quote is super flattering. And I was thrilled uh, to, there was a nice review of the book in the Times Literary Supplement, which is a really great visible uh, sighting. But, you know, the fate of the Roman Catholic Church uh, in and of itself certainly does not rest with me. But I will say, um, you know, one reason I very happily accepted Father Jenkins' offer to be provost is that I do think Notre Dame has an unparalleled leadership role in Catholic higher education. And if Notre Dame thrives, that's good for all of Catholic higher education. If Notre Dame struggles, that's not good for Catholic higher education. I don't think any place has the ambition, the reach, the potential of Notre Dame. I sometimes say that Notre Dame's attempt to be seriously Catholic and also as good as, every bit as good as, the culture-shaping institutions like University of Chicago and Duke and the other famous places we could name, uh, to do both, to be seriously Catholic and be, be as good as those places, that's the most exciting experiment in global higher education. And so that, yeah. that for me, that's why, why, you, why you do the job, uh, not out of a outsized grandeur about my role, but my sense that what happens at Notre Dame really matters. That's fantastic, Bill. So you're one year almost yeah. under your belt now as uh, as the Charles and Jill um, Provost of the uh, Fisher Provost of the University. Uh, what what is your assessment after one year? Uh, what surprises have there been? What part of the work gives you the greatest joy and meaning? Yeah, you know, um, so the joy is easy. It's the people. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that sounds like a cliche. I'm working with amazing people, and by the way, yourself very much included, in the provost's office and the other vice presidents and deans and the colleagues, I, the associate provosts and assistant provosts, all the people I work with every single day. I'm actually kind of awed uh, by their dedication to the university and its mission. Um, I just see it in so many ways every single day, and that's fun. And you know, we're actually trying to work on how do we create a kind of fun atmosphere within the provost office. And we're going to knock down a few walls and make it a little bit more open. And that's part of it, too, because we want that team atmosphere. I suspect, and, you know, having talked to Tom Bursch as one of my predecessors, almost everybody who comes into this role is a little bit surprised by the pace. Mm -hmm. It's intense. Um, but you wouldn't do the pace and it wouldn't be enjoyable if you didn't have such fantastic colleagues. So that's the thing that's really struck me most. Any, any surprises that, that have really kind of taken you aback a little bit that maybe the, the, you said something about the pace, but yeah. yeah. You know, the pace is, is, it, it is a little bit of a surprise in that, you know, there's whatever there are 24 direct reports. And so a lot of people uh, I need to kind of stay in close touch with. And then just the sense, which I know you know very well from working here a long time, that, oh, yeah, um, fall of 2027, I know exactly where I'll be on the third weekend of September. It'll be the such and such game or, yeah. or you know, we'll be going on our commencement. And so it's the sense of, oh, yeah, your calendar really gets filled up pretty quickly. But right. listen, I was eager for the job. That's part of the job. And so it's not a negative surprise. It's just getting used to that. So you, you uh, again, coming back to what you said before, that n the Notre Dame is, you know, arguably the most exciting experiment mm -hmm. yeah. in, uh, in the history of higher education. Tell us a little bit about that experiment. What makes um, the, the role of being provost mm -hmm. at Notre Dame so distinct and so exciting, but also what are the, the, the huge challenges in front of us? I mean, the big challenge is there's no roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you know, if you said to yourself, okay, the modern research university was invented in the 19th century. 
and it was invented in Germany. And in 20th century, it kind of moved to the United States. And again, some of those famous places, Chicago, Duke, Northwestern, Harvard, Yale, developed as research universities out of liberal arts colleges in the 20th century. Most of them, I will add, left their religious roots behind. Mm -hmm. I don't say that critically, but I do say that's an empirical fact. You know, yeah. most of them uh, left their religious roots behind. And so the word experiment, I've always thought makes sense because there's no roadmap and we don't know if we'll succeed. That is in building something distinctly and seriously Catholic, but every bit as good as the great culture shaping private research universities. That's an experiment. And, you know, 100 years from now, people will be able to assess whether or not we succeeded. But that gives Notre Dame all of its energy, you know, because that is really something different and something exciting. We have to be attentive to it all the time. And it plays out in every dimension of the university. It plays out in how we think about residential life. It plays out how we think about the student athlete. That is the student first and the athlete mm -hmm. next. It plays out in how we fire, hire and and nurture and train faculty. So uh, it's there in every dimension, that twofold mission of distinctly Catholic and seriously Catholic, but also truly great. And that, you know, it's gonna be very interesting a hundred years from now uh, to see where we are and, and and the steps that led to it and, and, and how it turned out. So let me put you on the spot with yeah. that. And this is probably an unfair question, um, but we're just two we're friends here in dialogue here. Here we are. Is do you see one part of that equation more challenging as the uh, than the other? That's really so is it the, the maintaining and strengthening yeah. Catholic character, the tougher piece, or making certain that we uh, have the same level of excellence, yeah. the top secular research institutions in the world? It, it is one, uh, are we a little further away on run for one front than the other? Boy, I mean, that is a really good question. And um you know, for me, it's day by day yeah. the answer to that. And so there are days when I say our big challenge is not to be too comfortable, for example, in our standards for tenure and promotion for faculty. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, we're tenuring and promoting good people, un unquestionably. But are we tenuring and promoting all people who can be leaders in that field? Mm -hmm. So on one day, I feel like that's our challenge, to be as good as the very best private research universities. Mm -hmm. On another day when I think we don't want to be, just be like everybody else. We need distinctive programs. We want a distinctive undergraduate student body. We want to connect residential life in a way that honors our Catholic character, mm -hmm. the academic core. Those are questions that are distinctive to Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. and some, on some days I think, okay, that's really what I have to be worried about. So I go day by day, week by week, thinking about both parts of that equation. Yeah. So let, let's come back to the, the tenure question. Many people looking in, um, it, they may say it vocally or they may think quietly that uh, uh, that seems to be an outdated model. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there should be tenure. There, nobody should have kind of a, a lifetime guarantee to a job. Um, make the case for tenure. And, and more importantly, how is the tenure in promotion process distinct Notre, yeah. at Notre Dame? What are the rigors that go into making the decisions about tenure and then full professor and endowed professor, et cetera? Yeah. Um, first of all, I think it's an entirely legitimate question. Mm -hmm. You know, we do have to think about the whole system of American higher education. It's under international pressure, political pressure from within the United States. And I can understand an, an outsider looking at the system and thinking, I don't know about this whole tenure process. It used to be a little bit more, if you were a partner in a law firm or a partner in a medical practice, you are kind of like a tenured faculty person, but that's not true in those industries anymore, but it still is true, at least in part of higher education. So what's the, so I understand the doubts and, and there are some genuine problems with the system. What's the case for it? Mm -hmm. uh, the case for it would be, first of all, that this is a sector of the international global economy where the United States is a leader. And so something's going right, mm -hmm. right? Look at the top 20 research universities, 15 maybe, would be located in the United States, and yet the whole world wants great research universities. So in that sense, this is a sector leading, um, or rather the United States is leading the sector in higher mm -hmm. education. So maybe we shouldn't fix it unless it's broken. Mm -hmm. More broadly, um, here's what happens for Notre Dame, and I should say for other places, um, to give someone tenure. Um, they have to get a PhD at a great program. And usually to get into a PhD program, 
they were at the very top of their undergraduate class. They didn't get many Bs if they're at a PhD program. Then they, uh, and that program, that PhD program lasts five or six years. And they have to do a major piece of original research. Then they have to usually do a postdoctoral fellowship of two to three years at another institution where they get more training and they're under more scrutiny. Then they apply for an academic job at Notre Dame. Our average applicant pool will probably be 150 applications, almost all of whom, or all of which, are from people with PhDs from leading institutions and postdocs and who are the best in their undergraduate class. Mm -hmm. And there's one job and there's 140 applications. Then they get hired at Notre Dame. Then they have another seven years of scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And during that time, and this is one thing that distinguishes Notre Dame, you have to demonstrate that you can be a national leader in research and you will publish in the most competitive journals and you will win outside grants and you will publish a book with the best possible press. Okay, you have to do all that. And that's a lot like, let's say, a University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Where we differ is we're explicit in saying every faculty member has to demonstrate that they're an excellent teacher. Mm -hmm. And when we, we bring in people from the outside, when we hire somebody from University of Chicago and they come to Notre Dame, they're stunned by the attention we place, even though we're a research university on teaching. And so we have people visit the classrooms of this faculty member and we study the syllabi and we look really care carefully at the student evaluations. So if you add it up from age 18, four years as an absolutely top performing undergraduate, mm -hmm. three years on a postdoctoral fellowship, I'm right, then six years of graduate school, then three years on a postdoctoral fellowship, then another seven years uh, in a, what we call a tenure track position. That's when the tenure decision occurs. So we're making a decision on a lot of data. Mm -hmm. We know a lot about this person. And we're saying in a university, unlike a corporation, you become an owner mm -hmm. when you're a tenured faculty person. You are one of the owners. And you have an ownership stake in this institution. And we think long term, it's better to give people an ownership stake in the institution because they will do a lot of the work in hiring other people, in yeah. running the committees we need to run. Uh, to make sure that institution thrives. So, so, so sorry to dwell on this. I mean, sorry to dwell on this so much, John, but yeah. I, I think this is a little understood concept. Yeah. How rigorous is the screening um, process? So what what do you do? You, I, I know you've talked a lot about the PAC yeah. um, you know, committee. Talk a little bit about that and also how you seek outside endorsements as well. And what what, what is the rigor that you go through before you make that decision to become a tenured professor? That's a good decision. Uh, rather a good question. Uh, I'll help you make good decisions. Um, so there's a committee at Notre Dame. The most important committee at Notre Dame is called the PAC, the Provost Advisory Committee, PAC. And what they do is they advise the provost on these tenure decisions. So first, the department makes an assessment. Now, how do they make an assessment about one of their colleagues who is asked to be promoted to tenure and usually the rank of associate professor? Well, they get together and they read that person's publications and they ask themselves, is this person going to be a leader in the future? How good is this work? Then they observe the teaching. Then they ask seven outside experts from totally from outside of Notre Dame, who are usually very distinguished professors at major research universities themselves for a candid appraisal of the candidate scholarship. Hmm. And we study those letters. And we ask very direct questions. We say, would this candidate receive tenure at your institution? That is, if they were coming up at, at Duke or Chicago or Harvard or Yale, would they get tenure there? Mm -hmm. um, how do you assess the quality of the work? Do you see the, any major deficits in the work? Mm -hmm. And we study those letters. Mm -hmm. And then the Provost Advisory Committee makes a recommendation to the provost. We have a long discussion. We did, we've completed the process in March this year. We had four 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. days of meetings. Uh, and then they make a recommendation to me and I make a recommendation to Father Jenkins, who's the only person in the end who makes the decision on tenure. Everything else is a recommendation to the president at every level, at the department mm -hmm. level, at the level of the dean, at the level of the provost and the level of the president. There is substantive conversation. And we yeah. talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the candidate. And then we make a decision. So there is it is a pretty involved high level of scrutiny process. Right. And then after somebody gets tenure, um, it doesn't mean that there are not additional 
incentives right. and stepping stones for them, right? To become next is to achieve things, to become a full professor, and then ultimately to, to become an endowed professor. Yep. I, one of the more moving things that I've attended over the years is the investiture yeah. of an endowed professor when they have their family present yeah. and they talk about the intense work and years and the sacrifices that they have made being away from their family yeah. to pursue their research and teaching at the highest levels. Um, what does it take to be an endowed professor? Yeah. yeah, I've been at those ceremonies too. It's often very moving. It is. The whole family is there and, um, you know, it, it takes a lot. Yeah. Um, so as a rough rule of thumb, you know, when you get tenure, we say, well, in seven or eight years, you need to double the amount of work that you did to get tenure, but it has to be better. Mm -hmm. uh, and we very specifically say you should have an, at the time of tenure, maybe you have a national reputation. Mm -hmm. at the time of promotion to what we call full professor you should have an international reputation. Mm -hmm. And then the very best people who've been promoted to full professor, we say, you know what? You merit an endowed chair. Mm -hmm. And at all, every level of that process, we go get outside letters again. We ask the experts in the yeah. field, what do you really think of this person? Full yeah. professor or endowed chair? Yeah. And the idea is our endowed chairs, the people who hold those positions, are going to be magnets for other great scholars. Yeah. They, they will, because they're so good, um, they will help us attract other really good people and enhance the overall intellectual life of the university. There's much more rigor that goes into it than I think, uh, yeah, yeah, you I know, think so. people imagine. But yeah. um, let's talk a lot of, little bit about um, it, not just your acclimation to the provostship, but this first year you've been really focused on um, something that we do every 10 years, roughly mm -hmm. around here, and that is the strategic framework, in particular, where should the academy be looking to go over the next 10 years and beyond? Tell us a little bit about how that has consumed your time and, and where do you feel we're at and how excited you are to release kind of a framework? You know, I, I feel really good about it. It has been the number one project this year. And, and in a way, that was pretty lucky that I got to come in as provost just as this was getting off the ground. It was begun by a lot of great people. Uh, in the couple of years beforehand. But now we we knew we had to have a product uh, sometime this summer. So we had 12 months after I came in July 1. It, it's been a complicated process. You know, we had seven university-wide theme committees talking about things from academic excellence to um, stewardship to engagement to how we think about particular areas like poverty or health and well-being where we think we can make a real difference. They filed their reports. We had a, a cluster of people studying each individual strategic plan for the college and schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're in the process of how do we think through what are the goals for the university over the next decade? What are the things that we think Notre Dame can do that maybe nobody else can that will enhance those two dimensions of the university, truly excellent, seriously, distinctly Catholic, and position us better a decade out from now? Mm -hmm. So we're really kind of in the final stages. Um, I think I've made 21 presentations. I just made one at the library this morning. I'm going over to admissions later this afternoon uh, about where we are. We did three sessions with the board of trustees uh, in the fall. Uh, as you know, we brought out a guy named Bill Kirby, who's written a book from Harvard, who's written a book on the history of higher education. And he and Father Jenkins did a terrific interview together in front of the board in January uh, we studied three different strategic plans from Duke, not because we want to be Duke, we want to be Notre Dame, uh, but what can we learn from another institution? And then just a few weeks ago in May, uh, I made a presentation uh, to the board of trustees, and we had about two and a half hours of discussion uh, mm -hmm. in small groups where we talked about where we are in the plan and what ideas people really thought were great and what ideas uh, people were maybe less enthusiastic about or wanted framed in a different way. And now our office is going to start writing and yeah. we're going to prepare a draft for Father Jenkins. Uh, he's going to look at that and other university leaders will look at it and study it and then ultimately hope to present it to the board of trustees at the end of the summer. So a long process. And maybe it sounds bureaucratic and boring, but it has been absolutely the opposite of that. It's been fun to think together about what Notre Dame can do, given all the resources and all the great people that we have to make this a better church, better world, better country 
in the next decade. You've said before, John, in, in conversations that, you know, your biggest concern is whether or not we will dream boldly enough uh, through the strategic uh, framework and the visioning process. Say a little bit about where, where, why that's a big concern for you. You know, we could be pretty complacent. And one of the great things about Father Jenkins is he is never complacent. Mm -hmm. Look at all the things we've been given. We have this beautiful campus. We have more fabulous undergraduates who want to study here than we could possibly admit. And we, it breaks our heart to turn down a lot of those great students. Mm -hmm. um, we have a passionate, unbelievably passionate, and even every now and then a bit too passionate um, base of alumni and, and supporters. And people would kill for that at other institutions. We have a distinct identity. Again, uh, not everybody has that. And, and the identity I just mentioned about being distinctly and seriously Catholic and being one of the best research universities in the world, most places don't have such a sharp definition of who they are. So we have amazing advantages and it would be kind of easy just to keep going, uh, mm -hmm. honestly. But Father Jenkins has challenged us and, and, and the board has challenged us. We should do more. Mm -hmm. We should expect more out of Notre Dame. And we have to have some big things to make Notre Dame better, sure, but contribute to a, uh, you know, a country, a world, uh, very much in need. And so uh, that would be the f maybe deepest fear I have. Are we really being ambitious enough? Now, I feel good about where we are, where we are but yeah. that's, uh, that's a driving motivation. So, you know, Father John, one of my favorite things that Father John has said uh, uh, in recent years is that most universities have really become multiversities. Uh, it's every they're they're very strong decentrally and and weak centrally and it's basically every tub to its own bottom and the silos that are the colleges and the departments yeah. and so forth make it very difficult to kind of work collaboratively across lines to to try to combat some of the world's greatest challenges. Um, one of the big things I know coming out of the strategic planning process is not just what comes out of the departments and colleges, but what are the high impact interdisciplinary big ideas that you're going to put forward. Can you begin to kind of share with us what are some of those ideas, those high impact uh, big ideas that uh, that you're most excited about? Sure. But, but let me go back a second and say you're absolutely right that a core principle should be that Notre Dame should be thinking as an institution. Yeah. We should be better than anybody else at that. We um, have a, a common mission. Mm -hmm. We are geographically contiguous. That is at a lot of great universities. If, if we're at Northwestern, right? They have a campus in, in the Loop in Chicago and they have a campus in Evanston. It's a little bit tougher to coordinate. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're at Columbia or some other place. Um, we're at Notre Dame. We have major advantages. So we should be best in class in thinking as an institution. And, and by that, I mean... You know, in the last generation at Notre Dame, we founded 33 different centers and institutes, and that made Notre Dame better. Mm -hmm. That was a good thing. Um, next generation, we probably don't found 33 more. Mm -hmm. We figure out how the new things that we do, and we'll do some new things, but the already valuable things that we have will be better aligned. Mm -hmm. Centers and institutes and colleges and schools will be working not at cross purposes, but together on some big issues, even as they, of course, are working on the ordinary day-to-day -day issues that, that preoccupy them. Yeah. So that is really an important principle. Mm -hmm. Let me give you one example, and you asked for concrete examples. Um, so we're really good at the study of poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lab for Economic Opportunities is within our econ department is, is, is really about the best in the United States at evaluating anti-poverty programs. Um, we're getting better through the Keogh School and the Pulte Institute at thinking about poverty and development outside the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to ask them uh, to really intensely work together mm -hmm. to think through how Notre Dame, not just in those two units, but maybe across multiple units, becomes the absolute best place to study poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would enhance our academic reputation. That would enable us to recruit better graduate students that would uh, give us an, a faculty a kind of uh, institutional identity. And it would also make the world a better place. We won't be able to do that unless we think as an institution. Mm -hmm. Another example would be mental health. Um, very rarely, oddly enough, 
do the researchers who study mental health collaborate with those who have care of and are worried about students suffering from mental health problems? But our uh, Office of Student Affairs under the Vice President, Father Jerry Olinger, and our Department of Psychology, which is in the College of Arts and Letters, they're working together on that issue. Mm -hmm. We're going to establish a mental health clinic, state-of-the-art, evidence-based mental health clinic in South Bend that's going to elevate our research and allow us to make a contribution to such, you know, honestly heartbreaking issues like why do young people commit suicide and, and how do people get addicted? We're going to make a contribution to that and we're going to help our students who really have some of whom have severe mental health challenges and the local community. So anyway, those are both examples of issues we might tackle in the next decade, mm -hmm. but we will only tackle them if we think we can get better by thinking as an institution. Right. Maybe mention something along those lines about democracy. Yeah. That's another of the really big key issues we're looking at. We have a great track record in the study of democracy. The Kellogg Institute for International Affairs has been doing that for 40 years. Now they used to, I mean, they always focused on Latin America mm -hmm. and um, we used to think democracy in Latin America had nothing to do with democracy in the United States because in Latin America, they didn't trust elections and there were worries about coups and all that kind of thing. Well, we now know those are worries in the United States too. You know, people mm -hmm. trust the electoral process and doubts about democracy. So we've asked the Kellogg Institute, our political science department, the Rooney Center for American Democracy, the Lou Institute for Asian Asian Studies, which is going to make democracy a key theme in the next decade for their work, we will have to pull them together and say, okay, what is, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, what is the big picture contribution Notre Dame can make on democracy? Yeah. Study of democracy. The one thing I would add to that, which is unusual, we also think Notre Dame has some convening potential. Mm -hmm. um, when Father Jenkins goes to Washington, and he meets with legislators. And when he meets with the Democrats, he's one in a list of university presidents who meets with the Democratic legislators. When he meets with Republicans, they tell him, I, I'm not, I don't tell anybody, they tell him nobody else is doing this. Mm -hmm. okay. And that gets to, again, Notre Dame's Catholic mission. I like to think we're seen as neither left nor right. Mm -hmm. And that we have the possibility, maybe in Washington, uh, but certainly in South Bend, to convene people on both sides of the political aisle uh, right. to have the conversations the country needs on tough questions, you know, immigration, abortion, you name it. Mm -hmm. We have the conversations we need as a country and Notre Dame, could Notre Dame maybe play a role in that process? Yeah, so um, say a word about your area of expertise, global Catholicism. Yeah. What, what, what is the, the, the future role that Notre Dame might try to, to step up and play yeah. Uh, a more significant, uh, have more significant impact on? You know, one, it's something I think about a lot and, and, and gosh, it's been great to talk about this with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, the Catholic, Catholicism is the most global, multicultural, multilingual institution in the world. Mm -hmm. There are 1.2 billion baptized Catholics in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And the modal Catholic, the average Catholic in the world does not look like me. Mm -hmm person of color living in the global South and sub-Saharan Africa or the Philippines or Mexico or the Caribbean. And if Notre Dame is going to live up to its Catholic mission and be the global Catholic research university, we're going to have to better embody that reality. We're going to have to become more diverse because as we become more diverse, we'll be more Catholic. We're going to have to be, to be more Catholic. We're going to have to become more diverse. So mm -hmm. that's something I'm thinking about a lot. Um, one you know, possible strategy there is to do financial aid for international undergraduates. We've not done that before mm -hmm. uh, uh, broadly, and, and most places haven't. It's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but if we did it, we might be able to create more of a global Catholic community in South Bend, mm -hmm. as well as the wonderful things that we do to send all of our students to do study abroad. So again, you get back to if we're the leading global Catholic research university, we have to think about where the Catholic Church is, grow is growing mm -hmm. and how we better embody that as an institution. Fantastic. You know, one of the things that, uh, that Notre Dame is known for is a superb undergraduate experience. In fact, one of the goals that Father John has put forth to us is to make certain that we offer an unsurpassed yeah. undergraduate experience for our students. 
it would be easy to be complacent on that front. I agree. How do we get better? What inroads can we make to still strengthen an already excellent yeah. undergraduate experience? I couldn't agree more. That is that is a place we could become complacent, and we can't do that. Um, undergraduate education is the core of Notre Dame, the absolute core of the experience. And we do study it. Our, you know, we have a senior exit survey, which we can compare to other institutions, and we come out quite well on that survey. We track where do our students get jobs and what kind of graduate programs are they admitted to. We do very well on that as well. But there's still work to do. Um, just a couple of examples. One is I'm a big believer in undergraduate research. I think that can be a game changing experience for undergraduates, whatever career is it business or politics or industry or whatever that they want to enter. And, and, you know, we vary department by department, school by school in how many students get exposure to research. And so I'd like to see more of that occur over the next decade. I'm a big believer in study abroad. And again, we send 75% of our students uh, abroad, which is third highest in the country. But I'd like to make that a little bit more rigorous um, at its least attractive, which is not the normal thing, but at its least attractive. It maybe is too much traveling and, and socializing and not enough connection to the undergraduate academic experience. Mm -hmm. so those are ways maybe we think about challenging, but I also think about supporting our undergraduates. An amazing change, a really welcome change at Notre Dame is that 20% of our students this year, through the good work of everybody in admissions, 20% of our students this year are either first-generation college students or what we call Pell eligible. Mm -hmm. That is Pell grants or federal grants. And that means your family income is $70,000 a year or less. Mm -hmm. Notre Dame's never had that high a number before. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge achievement. But what that means is we have to figure out how to support those students. Yeah. So that their undergrad, you know, often they come here differently prepared. They did not have often the high level calculus, for example, in mm -hmm. high school, or they did not have some of the rigorous writing programs that are best high schools in the country. Mm -hmm. And so we have to figure out how those students feel supported and, and what enables them to thrive so that when they finish Notre Dame, they are every bit as happy and proud and satisfied with that Notre Dame undergraduate experience as our majority students are. So mm -hmm. that's something I think about a lot. So John, how do we strengthen what we're doing on the graduate and the professional levels. Um, it, it's, I think, long been understood that we're stronger as an undergraduate institution. Is this fair to assume? And, and not as strong at the graduate professional level. If that's the case, how do we get stronger? Yeah, I mean, I would say the biggest difference between us and a University of Chicago is the relatively low top 10, number of top 10 PhD programs that we have, mm -hmm. you know, relative to, a, we have some, Mm -hmm. Very proud of that. University of Chicago has a lot more. So that is a difference between the two institutions. Um, I think we have every bit as good or better an undergraduate experience. Mm -hmm. um, professional schools, you know, we have strong uh, professional schools. We have a top 25 law, top 25 MBA. The real interesting question is how could you make that uh, even stronger and mm -hmm. even more influential? So we have a lot of good things to say about uh, particular professional degrees. But even there, we can't be satisfied with where we are. So, I mean, I mean, the good news is I don't see these as trade-offs. I don't see, oh, well, if we work on the PhD program, the undergraduate program will suffer. Or if we work on the law program, the PhD program will suffer. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually true that a rising tide lifts all boats. As mm -hmm. our academic reputation increases in one area, there's a kind of halo effect. Uh, it increases. So when you hear the word Harvard or whatever, you think, Oh, yeah, that must be a good program, even if the program's terrible, because mm -hmm. you have a high image of the university. And that's where we, we don't want terrible programs, but that's where we want to get to, where everyone is so, thinks Notre Dame is so unbelievable mm -hmm. um, that you just assume a program is one of the world's best. All right. How about um, in the areas of STEM, science, technology, engineering, math? Uh, again, we've been known probably as being stronger in the humanities and the social sciences how do we get stronger in the STEM disciplines? Yeah, I think that's probably true. You know, when, when Father Hesburgh, um, when he got the first real money for academic purposes, and, and remember, it was a completely different place 60 years ago. What's amazing 
the Father Hesburgh and his generation, what's amazing is how much they did with so relatively little, how much mm -hmm. they accomplished. Uh, when he got his first real money in the 60s, he created endowed shares in philosophy and theology. Mm -hmm. he wanted to do, and those were good investments. Those are great departments for us now. In science engineering, of course, it's a lot more expensive. It would be easy in a way to say, well, let's, let's leave that to the side and, and not invest in that. But I honestly do not think you can have a great research university in the 21st century unless you are competitive at the highest levels in science and engineering. You just cannot. Mm -hmm. There are too many fundamental questions in those areas. And by the way, areas like ethics, where we're, we, we really think we can be number one, um, will be enhanced by really strong science and engineering programs and vice versa. Uh, a great ethics program will really enhance them. So. I, we're not, these, aren't, these aren't really trade-offs either. Great humanities programs will enhance science engineering and vice versa. I, I will add finally there, you know, there aren't going to, there are very few Catholic places that can compete at the highest level in science and engineering. And I would say actually we're the most equipped to compete by far. Mm -hmm. And we need a Catholic place uh, in that game at the highest level. That's very important given the centrality of science and engineering to the future of research universities. Fantastic. Um, John, one final question. Um, you uh, are finishing your first year. Uh, we're still very early in your tenure. There's, there's a lot of hope and, and excitement about the future and the leadership that you will bring to it. Um, what, what, what's has you most excited what what parting kind of words of, of wisdom would you like to leave to our viewers as we as we kind of you know think about the, yeah. the future of notre dame yeah um first think how lucky we are mm -hmm. everything that notre dame has been given in terms of the mission of the university the identity of the place the resources we've been given and then think how hard we have to work mm -hmm. you know we have a very distinctive identity and mission, but to live up to that, we have lots of work to do. So both things are true. And again, it's why I'm really happy to be in this role. We have a chance to do amazing things here, but that doesn't happen by chance. It only happens with a coordinated effort that includes, I'm sure, everybody listening on this call, uh, as well as all my colleagues at the university, so that we can just be the very best possible Notre Dame that we can be. That's a beautiful way to end things, uh, as you say. Connor Blessings and yeah. many of the people viewing this today uh, or the rebroadcast of this are people who have sacrificed uh, yes. immensely to, to support the vision of Notre Dame. And then, as you said, uh, Father Soren's vision, become one of the most powerful means for good in all of society. We've got a lot of work to do yep. and uh, we should work without rest yep. uh, to try to get there. So on that note, one of the great things around here is that we know that it's not just all of us working together, but we have to call upon, you know, the divine uh, to support us. And as we do with these programs, let us uh, let us close together uh, with a prayer to Our Lady, uh, mm -hmm. to whom this university uh, is devoted. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray right. for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. John, thank you. So excited about your leadership. God bless all of you and go Irish. Thanks, Lou. Go Irish.